Hey everyone, today we're going to go over the 2017 Hypertension Guidelines released by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Now in this video we're going to talk about choosing medications for hypertension. So whether you're a nurse or a practitioner picking which medicine to prescribe as a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or a physician, these are the medications and the little caveats of which ones do you choose in which particular patients for hypertension. Which one you try first, second, third? For this patient, that disease, we're going to go over a bunch of little things. If you want to watch the first video, the actual diagnostic criteria or the actual hypertension guidelines and the changes that are there in the numbers to diagnose hypertension, check out the first video. You can click on the link just right there at the top, the little, little eye, it's right there. Just click on it, you can go watch that video. First, let's just do a quick look at what the guidelines are. You can check them out in the other video. These are what the new guidelines are. Of course, we've got this new category, elevated blood pressure. And of course, stage one and stage two are shifted down. And you can see here, that's a whole lot more red on this chart than the old chart for the JNC8 guidelines. Because stage two hypertension starts at above 90 diastolic and above 140. And of course, um, running through those treatments of what do you choose and when. Let's recap who to treat, what to treat, and when do you reassess them. In a normal patient who has normal blood pressure, adults above 18 years of age, you should reassess them every year, no matter what. For that elevated blood pressure category, that above 121 systolic to 129 systolic, that's elevated blood pressure, the two new little category. Those group use non-pharmacologic therapy, diet, exercise, low sodium diet, DASH diet, make sure they have potassium, weight loss, all those great things. And then you will reassess them, importantly, within three to six months to make sure they have an advance and that what they're doing is working. For stage one hypertension, above 130 systolic to 139 uh, systolic or above 81 diastolic to 89 diastolic, those are stage one hypertensives now. Those patients, now you move next and you say, hmm, we need to calculate what? Well, we need to calculate their ASCVD risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk in 10 years. What's the 10-year risk that they're going to percentage that they're going to have a coronary event or cardiovascular event? If it's less than 10%, they go over into the non-pharmacologic therapy, diet, exercise, weight loss, low-sodium diet, all those great things, and you see them in three to six months. If they're over 10%, and that calculator, you can see it online, includes age, it includes other risk factors, smoking, uh, diabetes, other things, as well as cholesterol, then you know they're above 10%, well then they immediately go into the category of non-pharmacologic therapy, as well as, at the same time, pharmacotherapy. No more, give this thing, see it in three months, and then start a medicine, blah, 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 doesn't work. If they're in this category, you've got to start both at the exact same time. If you start a medicine, it's also very clearly recommended, you need to see them again in four weeks or a month. That's what you need to do. And the new stage two category, which is everyone above 140 systolic or above 90 diastolic, what they say is stage two hypertension, well, we know that blood pressure takes usually several medications to control. So these people, you need to start them off. Yes, you give them non-pharmacologic therapy and at the same time, you give them the medications, pharmacotherapy, with one or two medications at the, at the same time. So they're coming in. Now they got high blood pressure and uh, they get a whole lot of stuff, right? Because we know that it takes a while to control these people. And of course, starting a medication, then you know you need to follow up within no more than one month to make sure to see how it's doing because those medications typically need titrated. Now let's move on to selecting medications. There are lots of different drug classes for treating hypertension. Oh, there's ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs. There's thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers, both dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines, loop diuretics, beta blockers, alpha-1 blockers, central alpha-1 agonists, as well as those direct vasodilators. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about what you would choose first in specific populations. We're not going to talk about adding medications in for other treatments. Yes, there are other indications for a lot of these medications. We are not going to go into those. These are in hypertensive patients, which ones you would choose for hypertension and which ones first and what to choose and what not to. We're going to talk about who gets what, when to avoid those particular ma medications in certain populations, and the big giant side effects that you got to watch for and make sure you're not having. Uh, there's lots of other details. We're not going into that because this is trying to stay very high, high level to give you the most information fastest. What we're going to focus on is who do we choose 
which one do, which of these do we choose as first line therapy? We're going to talk about uh, first line therapy for any patient. Now, I like to call these the medication virgins or the people without any other medical problems that we aren't going to list in the other uh, sections. You're first going to use an angiotensin inhibitor. So a pril, right? Lisinopril, one of cathopril, one, um, one of those prills. Or you're going to use an angiotensin receptor blocker. Uh, those are the sartans, losartan, valsartan, loticantosartan, all those sartans. Uh, or you're going to use a thiazide. Thiazide. Now, chlorthalidone is the one that's most studied. Or you can use hydrochlorothiazide. And there's some more details. You can uh, look those up when you look about thi learn about thiazides. The other first-line medication are calcium channel blockers, but specifically with these, the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. That includes the amlodipines and the philodipines, the dipines, right? Those are the ones you want to use in first-line therapy in a patient who comes in, newly diagnosed hypertension or newly treated hypertension, that you're going to use first. Whew, there's a lot of other medications. Yes, I know, there's a lot of them. And we're going to run through each one, and we're going to talk about all of those things that we need to watch for. Let's get started. Now, choosing the medication for hypertension, again, these are in patients that you're treating hypertension for. There are other causes or other reasons you can use these medications, and we're only talking about using them to treat hypertension. When are you going to use them? Well, first, let's kind of go with those first-line medications. ACE inhibitors. Well, you're going to use them first-line in the medication versions, right? Virgins, right? The people who haven't uh, ever received the medication before, they have no other medical problems. If you just need to pick one, these are the ones yeah, you probably pick it first. And of course, unless one of the other things in this category pertains to your particular patient. And we'll go through all of them. Also, in a diabetic patient, these are great. Um, they're good medications. Every diabetic should be on an ACE inhibitor. As well as uh, people with chronic kidney disease. And what's important with chronic kidney disease here is it's early stage chronic kidney disease. Stage 1 to 3. They should be on an angi uh, ACE inhibitor. What's important here is that when do you avoid them? Well, you avoid ACE inhibitors in severe renal disease because they're not going to do very well. And ACE inhibitors, sorry, slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. They're shown to slow down chronic kidney disease progression. Um, so the, you use them early on. And of course, in late renal disease, you don't want to use them. Those are the patients that have a GFR like less than 25, 20, 25. You don't want to use them. They're voided. Maybe it's 18. I can't remember exactly, but it's really low. Stage 4, um, you don't want to use... Um, ACE inhibitors. And of course, we're going to avoid them in pregnancy. Now, what about ACE inhibitors? There's major side effects, big thing you watch for. Well, hyperkalemia. So a patient has hyperkalemia on admission, maybe you're not going to, maybe you're going to hold that ACE inhibitor, right? Exactly. Of course, we always worry about that crazy side effect of cough, that dry, nagging cough that some patients get and you forget that they're on an ACE inhibitor. Don't forget that one. Don't, don't be that person. And of course, angioedema. You can't miss that one. Those are the people with the big, big, puffy, swelled up cheeks, lips, once you see it, you never you never forget it. Their whole face swells up, and it's a really um, rare rare side effect, but serious side effect rather um, of that. So what happens if they get that cough? Well, if they get that cough, you usually switch them to an angiotensin receptor blocker or ARB. Angiotensin two rather receptor blocker ARBs. And of course, these people, um, these medications, you use it as the same people for ACE inhibitors. It has the same avoid it. Don't use it in severe renal disease. Use it in early. Um, chronic kidney disease, renal disease. Don't use them in pregnancy. But what's important for side effects? Well, it typically, typically doesn't have that cough, and um, the hyperkalemia still has a side effect, and it still can cause angioedema, but typically less. Um, these medications we usually use second. We usually use an ACE inhibitor first because that way then we can go to an angiotensin receptor blocker if there's an issue. One important point, and I see this sometimes, and it's a big no-no. Don't do it. It's very clearly spelled out in the 2017 guidelines. Do not use both an ACE and an ARB together. Don't do it. You can't do that. That's bad, bad, no, no, bad juju, don't do it. Also, be careful that you're not using a combination medication that has two medications together that may contain an ARB, and you have the patient also in a pril. You may also inherit some of these patients or see these patients out there. Don't do that. Bring that to somebody's attention. That needs to be stopped. The next class of medications are the thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics include chlorthalidone, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, right? Now, these medications are sulfonamides. You can, you can always tell because they have thia in them. That means they're sulfonamides. It's one of the ways to tell it's a sulfonamide medication. Some people have an allergy. You can remember that for later. 
These medications are great for first-line patients in any patient without any other medications, the medication version, the hypertension versions, we're going to call them. So no other comorbidities, you could use these medications that are preferred, the very first line. But also, if the patient's African-American or black, um, because African-Americans are black people all over the world, um, then you would want to use a thiazide diuretic. Also use a calcium channel block, we'll talk about that in a sec. But you, this is one of the medications you would choose for those patients. Now, who do you avoid a thiazide in? Well, if you have an allergy to, you know, a, that medication, great, or sulfa drug, sure. I think those things hopefully are obvious. But you want to avoid it in severe gout because thiazides can actually worsen. They cause hyperuricemia, so they can worsen severe gout. Don't give it to those people. That's just mean. Gout hurts. It's not fun. Also, big side effect of any kind of diuretic, or sorry, any kind of thiazide is hypokalemia, kind of a little sensitive electrolyte, hypokalemia, low potassium, as well as hypercalcemia. You, they can cause hypercalcemia. Uh, that's really important to remember because it's different than a loop diuretic, hypercalcemia, really commonly tested as well. Now, as we move forward, next we're going to talk about calcium channel blockers, specifically the dihydropyridines. That includes the amlodipine, philodipine, those dipines, right? Amlodipine, philodipine. Those are the ones that roll off my tongue the fastest. Amlodipine, uh, Norvask sometimes we say. Amlodipine is another first-line medication, calcium channel blocker, dihydropyridine. It's the first-line medication in a person who's a hypertensive virgin, the first line, one they never have any medicine, they don't have any comorbidities. And it's also a first line recommended or choice for an African American or black, African American patient. Um, a calcium channel blocker is a good first line medication for that patient population. Now, who do we avoid these in? Well, the major side effect of calcium channel blockers is peripheral edema or edema in general, typically in the legs. And that edema, pretty much more common in women than men. So you want to avoid it in patients with lots of edema, maybe a patient with nephrotic syndrome. You wouldn't want to give them amlodipine. That would, that would just be mean. You're going to make the edema worse. Or a patient who has severe dependent edema, like a patient in heart failure. So there's HEFREF, right? What's that mean? I'm, no, I'm not barking at Stitch. HEFREF, H-F-R-E-F. So the R, so heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction as the first line. Well, you don't want to use it. It can be used as a second-line medication, but you would never use it as a first-line. You can add it on later because it causes this edema. So you don't want to use it as a first-line. You don't have, you don't use it unless you absolutely have to. So why is that important to mention here? Well, because the next class of medications are the calcium channel blockers that are non-dihydropyridines. And I put these names in here because they're just kind of weird. and People forget them, and they forget non-dihydropyridines. I remember non-dihydropyridine. That's the names that, that are not sounding the same. Diltiazem and verapamil. Uh, those two medications are the non-dihydropyridines. You would only use those first line, first line for hypertension in a patient who also has atrial fibrillation. You would not use these medications as first line in a patient with any other comorbidities. They're not first line unless something else is going on. Then you add them in, and it just happens to have a little bit of blood pressure effect. Great, good for you. In a patient with atrial fibrillation, because these medications slow down AV conduction. That's what's important. Now, you want to avoid these patients, uh, avoid this medication in patients with edema, okay, because all calcium channel blockers cause this peripheral edema. And you absolutely never, ever, ever use it in reduced ejection fraction heart failure, HEFREF, right? As well as never giving calcium channel blockers along with beta blockers. Well, why would we not want to do that? Well, what do beta blockers do? They slow the heart rate down. And what do calcium channel blockers do? They block the AV node. So what happens? Slow heart rate. Or if you have a heart block or anything else, it's going to cause a lot of big problems. Don't do that. Don't be that person. Now, of course, we're going to talk about beta blockers now. I'm not going to go into all the different beta blockers because that could be a whole lecture about the different types of beta blockers. I just threw in a few things in here and the caveats you need to know about them. Beta blockers are beta blockers. There's beta 1, beta 2, um, beta cardioselective, uh, cardio non-selective, blah, 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 blah. There's a couple different ones. You can learn them. What's important here is that all beta blockers, well, major side effect, bradycardia. And then you can also use Beta blockers are never indicated as first line for treating hypertension all by itself unless the patient has heart failure or ischemic heart disease. That's when it relates to hypertension, and that's what's important. 
they get thrown in with a lot of other things because we're going to use it along with treating something else, that's when beta blockers may be used first line. That's the clear recommendations. Now, what are the ones you need to know? Well, I threw them over here, especially for um, HEFREF or heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Well, we want to use carvedilol. It's a great medicine for both metoprolol succinate. That's succinate means sustained. That means the long-acting metoprolol, as well as bisoprolol. Bisoprolol. Uh, those are the ones that are studied the most, particularly they have the greatest outcomes. Uh, metoprolol succinates, the sustained long-acting one, and metoprolol tartrate um, is the short-acting one. So we, we're talking about metoprolol succinate, um, which is really important. Um, th those medications are the most studied. Does that mean the other ones won't work? Well, that is kind of true, and you can look in the different ones to really get more information on selective versus non-selective. Now, the next type of medication we want to talk about are loop diuretics. Loop diuretics are, they work on the loop of Henle. They're diuretics and they work on the loop of Henle. This is where we talk about torsamide and furosemide, right? Furosemide, Lasix, common name. Well, these are medications that you really don't use first line for hypertension unless the patient has also concomitant fluid overload or heart failure patients or a patient with chronic kidney disease. Specifically, later stage kidney disease, you want to use it in the beginning. But typically, already have kidney disease, probably treating hypertension already. That would be really weird. But, you know, somebody, maybe they come in, um, they end up having some immediate renal failure somehow, then you could maybe start with a loop diuretic. But again, you're really um, not typically starting with these types of medication unless you're late diagnosed, blah, blah, blah. Um, but these are the scenarios when you'd use it first. But it's great for helping treat hypertension as well. You want to avoid it in severe gout, just like the thiazides. All the thiazides and the um, loop diuretics can cause hyperuricemia. They can cause, increase uric acid, which causes gout, and it hurts. Don't do that. That's mean. Hmm. Also, big time with loop diuretics, they cause hypokalemia. Those loop diuretics, they make you just pee out everything. They pee out all the potassium. It's a little weak electrolyte, and it's gone. Pee it right out. Also, hypocalcemia, as well as hyponatremia and every, all of it. You pee it all out with the loop diuretics. But specifically, you see hypokalemia, the big one. But just remember that loops versus thiazides. Loops lose everything, I always say. And you lose hi, um, all the, they lose everything as far as electrolytes. So you pee out potassium, sodium, and you also pee out calcium. Um, just important to remember. Next, I want to talk about the calcium, I'm sorry, the potassium sparing diuretics. These are amylaride and triamterine. These are two medications that just don't work well as monotherapy. All by themselves, you're not going to use them. You're just not. Uh, you're going to use them as an add-on medication. You're just not going to use them all by themselves to treat hypertension by itself. Don't do it. Don't be that person. You don't want to use them in severe kidney disease. And of course, major side effect of a uh, potassium sparing diuretic well, it spares potassium, and it causes hyperkalemia. Hmm, I thought that made sense, but I threw it in here anyway, just in case you forgot. The next one are aldosterone antagonists. Aldosterone antagonists include spironolactone and epileronone. Well, these medications, hmm, they antagonize aldosterone, right? So what does aldosterone do? Well, it holds on to sodium and dumps potassium. So what happens when you antagonize aldosterone? Well... Without aldosterone, if you're antagonizing it, what's going to happen is you're going to dump more sodium. So therefore, decrease fluid, right? That's right. It's kind of like a diuretic. Hmm. Wow, who thought of that? So of course, we're going to use these medications in hyperaldosteronism, those particular types of um, aldosterone. This is where you see somebody who has hypertension as well as hypokalemia. That's a patient who might clue you in that they have hyperaldosteronism. Uh, that's really important. And of course, you'd use these medications really just in resistant hypertension. You're not going to come in very often and throw these patients directly on um, spironolactone, aldactone, brand name, just as a monotherapy. Now, yes, you use aldactone along with a loop diuretic in things like cirrhosis or um, things with fluid overload. Yes, you do. You use it as an adjunct to those other medications, and that's what's important because it kind of holds on to its little friend potassium. That's right. You really want to avoid it in Addison's. I hope that makes sense. But that's because Addison's is exactly the opposite of hyperaldosteronism, right? You don't want to worsen that. That wouldn't be fun. That's right. And, of course, those major side effects, well, of spironolactone by itself, gynecomastia, guys. You just don't. That's not fun. And I don't think it'd be very fun for the girls either. Probably not. Because it can cause um, hirsutism sometimes. Yeah, not fun. 
But the big um, side effect, of course, if we are antagonizing aldosterone, hyperkalemia, again, potassium sparing diuretic as a class, uh, kind of as well. Just another thing to remember. The next type of medication I want to talk about are alpha-1 blockers. These are the ones that you just don't see very often in the next three classes. Alpha-1 blockers. What are these medicines? Well, these are the osins, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin. Those are the medications that are alpha-1 blockers. These medications have some other reasons you may indicate for treatment. Maybe you're thinking Tamsulosin, Flomax. Well, that's not for blood pressure. That one's a selective alpha-1 blocker. These are kind of non-selective alpha-1 blockers. They work more systemically. And if you have a patient who has hypertension as well as BPH, and they got an enlarged prostate, having a little trouble going PP, that's right, you could use an alpha-1 blocker. So you could put in some doxazosin along with it to help them. Now, what kind of patients typically get BPH? They're usually elderly men. So the patients that you'd choose these in are really the ones you want to avoid this medication in because it exacerbates the giant side effect of this orthostatic hypotension because you're really knocking out the away for the body to compensate and increase the blood pressure when you stand up. So you pass out. Mm, and it's worse in old people. Just be careful using that medication if you're going to use it for both. Um, it's, it's kind of it's like a blessing with a curse, I guess. The next one is a central alpha-1 agonist. These are centrally acting. The two medications that I'm going to talk about here are clonidine and methyl dopa, because it's just important things to know. Well, first off, clonidine. If you had a patient who has hypertension and maybe also withdrawing, clonidine might be your choice. Uh, clonidine can kind of help calm down withdrawal symptoms. Well, why? Because it has CNS effects. And that's exactly why clonidine by itself really not recommended in elderly, because those CNS effects are exacerbated in elderly people. That's why it's on that beer's criteria, right? You've got all those drugs memorized. I know you do. Clonidine specifically, big time. If you stop it right away, um, you can have some really crazy rebound hypertension. Really important to make sure that medication is tapered, especially if you're on a higher dose. Not gonna, it's not going to be pretty. Additionally, methyl dopa all by itself. Methyl dopa is a really good medication. It's the one we like to use in pregnant women. Um, so if you have a patient who's pregnant, they may go on methyl dopa. Then that may be the one you use. Now, if you're, um, you develop hypertension during pregnancy, there are other treatment algorithms for that, and that is separate. But if you become pregnant, maybe you're going to get switched over to methyl dopa, and vice versa. There's, a couple, there's some other caveats along with that. The last one I want to talk about, a little confusing here because there's really some specific things, are the direct vasodilators. These are really like the big guns of medications that you really should be using last. And I say last because one of the direct vasodilators rather, is hydralazine. You see hydralazine prescribed all the time. Eh, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams. Give it to them to lower their blood pressure intermittently. We see it kind of used PRN all the time in the hospital, right? And what about hydralazine? Well, it has that little side effect of causing drug-induced lupus, uh, SLE-like syndrome. Mm, I've never seen it, but I'm sure it's out there. And it's on all the tests, so make sure you know it. The other medication, minoxidil. Minoxidil is actually a great medication. Or if you're having some hair loss, you can put minoxidil up there on that little bald spot. I don't have a bald spot, right? No, I don't. Minoxidil, given systemically, is a great antihypertensive. It works amazingly well. However, it is not a friendly medication. It has to be closely watched, and it has a major side effect of fluid overload. It's going to cause edema and fluid overload like crazy. It's also going to cause hirsutism. Ladies, you're going to have hair growing places you just didn't want. And minoxidil is going to cause it. Hmm, who knew? What's really important with these medications? There's a lot of different things. But one of the big things, if you're going to use hydralazine um, in a heart failure patient with a reduced ejection fraction, studies out there recommend you need to have a nitrate, um, nitrate along with it, like isosorbide, along with hydralazine to really get a peak effect. But most importantly, if you're talking about vasodilators, a patient's already on three, four, five, six medications that control their, their blood pressure, and you decide, hmm, maybe we should switch to minoxidil because it's a lot less pills in this particular patient. Then what's important to know is you've got to give minoxidil, aside from closely watching it, you've got to give it with a loop diuretic, and you've got to give it with a beta blocker. You give it with a loop diuretic to get rid of the fluid. That fluid edema is a nasty side effect. 
as well as the beta blocker because you get all this systemic vasodilation. It works great, but what happens is when you dilate everything, well, the body compensates by shooting up the heart rate. So you give the beta blocker to slow the heart rate down um, along with the loop diuretic to combat the symptom of fluid overload. Sometimes just as medicine, medications for side effects. That's I feel like all medicine is sometimes. Well, that's all we've got. Thanks for watching today our videos. You can watch both videos on the 2017 Hypertension Guidelines. The first video, well, it's about diagnosing hypertension and those new guideline changes. The second video is all about the medications, which one you use and when, and all those little uh, disorders of why you choose which one. If you like this video, check out some more. Let me know what you want to see, and I'll make a video for you or your grandma or your dog. I don't know. Thanks for watching, and as always, click the little subscribe button. Just go down there and click it. Just click it and love it. Just make it your little friend. Just click, 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 click. And as always, good luck studying.